finishing up, finishing up our GI system, and then we will take a break, and then we're going to jump right into metabolism. For the digestive system, the accessory glands will be the pancreas and the liver. And we'll go through the pancreas, uh, which is a recap for you because we've already done the pancreas elements with the unit one with the endocrine component. Now we're just going to address the digestive element, which is going to be the eighth and ninth. We know the location of the pancreas within the abdominal cavity. You have to lift up the stomach. It's going to be right under there, right where the duodenum cups around it. We saw that. It's adjacent to the duodenum. Tail end is going to be over by the spleen. The histology, so if we make a slice through it, we look at the histology. You guys recall there is the darker portion, that's the acini, and that's what makes our digestive enzymes. The pancreas makes enzymes to digest all three of our macronutrients. That means carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. So the carbohydrate is going to be an amylase. Where have we heard amylase before? Salivary Excellent, salivary amylase. So the salivary amylase gets us started on digesting carbs. That crackers or noodles that you're eating, salivary amylase gets in there. It goes in the stomach because the acidity and the pepsin, that gets neutralized pretty quickly. And then we work on the proteins, if you recall, in the stomach. And then the chyme with the salivary amylase broken down carbohydrates and our partially broken down proteins from the pepsin and low pH gets to put into the duodenum. That's where the pancreas here will send pancreatic amylase. Now we'll finish up our digestion of our carbohydrates. We also then have, I'm gonna jump down here to trypsin. That's also going to finish off digesting our proteins where pepsin left off from the stomach. Pepsin was digesting proteins at a low pH where trypsin is gonna digest proteins at a more neutral pH. And then a new one here, pancreatic lipase. That is an enzyme that will digest fats. Now remember, we have two types of digestion. We have mechanical digestion, and that just means we're breaking up the, breaking up the food into smaller pieces of the food. So we're not changing it chemically at all. Okay, it's breaking down into smaller pieces. And then we have a second that's going to be chemical digestion, breaking chemical bonds. So if we're talking about steak, mechanical digestion is just chewing it up into smaller pieces. And you can help yourself by cutting it into smaller pieces first, then you're chewing it up. And then when we get down to the pepsin, it's gonna actually break apart those peptide bonds and now that's where we're chemically digesting. A cracker, for instance, we can smash it on the table and just scoop up and eat the crumbs, or we can just chew it. Again, break into smaller pieces. The amylase is going to break the bonds and then it will become more like monosaccharides or goes from the large polysaccharides into disaccharides and you know, ultimately the monosaccharides. So then that's chemical digestion. The reason I'm laying this out here is fat is a little, more complicated, but not by much. But if you divide it into these two things, it'll make your life a lot easier. So pancreatic lipase is going to be the chemical digestion part of fat. In a little bit, when we get to liver, we're gonna talk about the mechanical digestion. Because if you're gonna eat, say, just a big old wad of butter, there you go, just fat, or Crisco, anything with big lardo fat, just eat it, your chewing's really not gonna do a lot of good with that. So we're gonna have to mechanically break it down in a little different way. When the pancreas sends out these digestive enzymes, it goes through the pancreatic duct and literally just oozes into the duodenum. So we can see it's going right into the duodenum. We have our chyme, which came from the stomach, so it's already pre-processed to some level. So proteins have begun to break down. We have a little carbohydrates on their way to breaking down. And then fats, really not much has been happening to fats. So the duodenum is the location where everything is going to get digested. Fats really start to finish. Carbs and proteins just finish up what had been started previously. In the liver, we do a lot of things. 
So we're just gonna do really big picture things here about the liver. The point of the liver is that it makes so many elements in our body. It can make glucose, it can make triglycerides, it can actually make different amino acids from other amino acids. It's making plasma proteins, it makes ketone bodies, but ultimately bile, the bile that comes from liver is really the waste. So as it's processed, it also detoxifies um, some of the detoxifying elements or waste elements. We talked about the liver processing bilirubin, getting rid of it. Once the liver's done with stuff, it's like it's garbage disposal stuff, the stuff that's exiting is going out the bile. So bile is really just waste from our liver, but we use bile for something else that we're gonna talk about here with regard to fat digestion. So we kind of try to get a benefit of the waste as we're getting rid of it in our body. So the anatomy of the liver is, it's, we know it's the largest organ we saw in our cadaver. Previously, you can see quite easily the two main lobes. So we have these two large lobes and there's two smaller lobes that are not as easily seen, at least on the cadaver that we have here. We didn't dissect it down that far. The two main ligaments I want you to know about is the falciform ligament with more of a membrane between the two largest lobes. And then there's ligamentum teres, also known as the round ligament, which is the rem remnant of ductus venosus from the fetal circulation. So if you call, recall, if I'm a fetus, and there's the placenta out here, the umbilical vein is coming back to the belly button, and then on the inside from the belly button, on the inside of the belly button to the liver is going to be the ductus venosus, but once the belly button's been, or the umbilical cord's been snipped off, that ultimately atrophies and just turns into a ligament. So that's going to be ligament and teres or the round ligament. And we saw that in the cadaver as well. So this here we can see is falciform ligament. And then this, the dotted line represents the ligament and teres as it's going kind of inferior and more superficial as it's meeting up to the backside of the belly button essentially. The vessels, we have two main vessels that are bringing blood to the liver. And we have one vessel that's going to leave the liver with clean blood. So the hepatic artery is bringing blood into the liver. The hepatic portal vein is also bringing blood to the liver. Where is the hepatic artery coming from and what type of blood is it? Oxygenated blood. Mm -hmm. Celiac trunk. Yep. So it's just like any other organ. It gets its own blood supply. So it's bringing blood to the liver. It's gonna have some body generated waste as well in it to, for the liver to check out and to remove. What about the hepatic portal system? Where's the source of that? The gut, the gut spleen, just anything that are sort of abdominally we picked up and we're gonna bring it to the liver to be evaluated, filtered before we dump it out into our systemic circulation. This is, shows you the hepatic portal system. So it shows you the veins returning from the guts, stomach, spleen on its way up into the liver. Then the hepatic vein is gathering all of the cleaned blood, the now filtered blood, so essentially consider it cleaned out blood, is now gathering it and then the vessel leaving the liver would be the hepatic vein, dropping into the inferior vena cava and then obviously to the heart is the next stop. This is a recap of the fetal circulation. So if you recall the umbilical arteries, so we have the umbilical arteries going to the placenta, umbilical vein coming back. And then once we hit this donut in this picture, but that's the belly button. So that's what that little there thing is there. Then the liver's over here. So then we have ductus venosus going over. The ductus venosus is going to turn into ligamentum teres. In the liver, it's our largest organ, it's also our more, most dense organ. And it's very dense because things are packed in very, very tightly. So I'm gonna use these markers as an example. So we have these markers, you know, if we line them up together like this, then you can see this is really similar to these columnar structures throughout the liver. When things are packed in nice and tight, it makes for a very dense. If it was all jumbled around, it wouldn't be as dense and compact as it is, even though it is large. So the liver has these columns of cells, and we are going to then fit between the cells 
series of vessels that's adjacent to them. So we can see here's on a close-up view. So we have these columns, one of these sort of hexa hexagon-shaped columns, then up and down the distance, vertical distance of the columns, we're gonna have three sets of vessels. We'll go through those. It's known as the portal triad, being the three, and they're at every one of the corners of a single column, if you will. And then some of them, if they're in between, obviously will serve adjacent columns. The lobules, that would be a cross section of a single column. So if we look at the liver cross section histologically, this hexagon thing, we are going to have the portal triad off to the side. We have the hepatic artery, it's at all of the corners, so let's draw a couple here. We have the hepatic portal vein. The two of them are going to send blood, each of them, it's on all the corners. Again, I'm only just doing a couple of these. Sending blood towards the center. The center here, this is known as the central vein. So the central vein is receiving this blood. There are series of cells called sinusoids all through, that's really what these columns are made of. They're just, it's densely packed with these cells, which are the sinusoids. Waste, as we're removing waste from the liver, is coming back the opposite way and going in. The blue here is the hepatic portal vein, and the red is going to be just the hepatic artery. So we have the hepatic artery and the hepatic portal vein bringing blood from the outside of each one of these lobules toward, directed toward the central vein, whereas the bile duct is bringing fluid that's going to be picking up waste along the way and bringing it out. How this does it, and one of the important reasons why we want them to go in opposite directions to each other, is it maximizes the amount of waste that the bile duct can pick up. So if we have the flow of the blood from the periphery out towards or in towards the central vein, and we have you know, a lot of waste as we start out. And obviously as waste gets picked up and removed, less of it, you know, arrives. So you'll have maybe a little bit, but most of the waste gone by the time the blood gets into the central vein because we've been removing it, which is the whole point of the sinusoids. The bile that's going this way by having it started here and coming this way, we maximize the amount of waste that it can pick up because here it's fresh bile oil that has no waste in it, right? So it's got, you still have a decent concentration gradient this way. And so it picks up some waste. We'll pick the blow waste. And then you know, as it's coming this way, we still have a concentration gradient, and we pick up some more waste. And now we come here, and so even though it's picking up waste, it's still less than the full-on fresh waste arriving to the liver. So we're able to maintain a high concentration, or concentration gradient along the entire duration that they are together. In contrast, if you had a vessel here, going this way, and the bile following it, you would have a whole lot of waste at the start, and it would go this way, and you have a little less waste, and you'd have all of this waste here. So all of a sudden, you'd have so much waste, it would be equilibrated, and you wouldn't bring any more over, because it would actually equilibrate right away. And so you would get some out, but not maximize it. This way, even when we're down to very little, by having no waste here, we still created a concentration gradient. So what arrives to the central vein is really clean blood. So that's gonna be our clean blood. Then each of the lobules, the central vein, ultimately 
ultimately is going to exit the liver as the hepatic vein. Okay, so here this is again on the computer version here. The sinusoids are the cells that are doing the filtering. The portal triad is, includes the hepatic artery, the hepatic portal vein, and they bring blood in towards the center to the central vein. Then the bile duct or the bile comes out away from the central vein, carrying more and more waste as it goes until you get to the bile duct on the outside. So each one of those individuals is known as a portal triad. So you'll need to know the name of each of the components of the portal triad and the direction of flow and the source of each one. Hepatic portal vein coming from and where's, how about the hepatic artery and which vessel would have say waste and oxygen that would be the hepatic artery or which would be picked up nutrients and waste from the gi tract hepatic portal vein um, which would have which would contain waste to be removed from the liver that would be the bile duct um, where what is the source of the hepatic vein that would be the central canal here in the middle and you know overall which vessel would have the clean blood and that would be the hepatic vein. So basically leaving the liver, you have your clean blood. So we have the central vein, receives the filtered blood, it's ultimately gonna drain into the hepatic vein. These green dots, we've removed waste, we've got the waste here, now we're gonna collect all of these little bile duct waste components, and then ultimately we come here in out of the liver, and so the portion around the black square is known as the common hepatic duct. So it's all of these little bile ducts coming from all the regions of the liver, all coming down. So when they all come together, the one main exit leaving the liver is the common hepatic duct. Then to store bile, because our liver is constantly just working, constantly making it, so we need a little pouch to store bile. So the cystic duct is sort of like the driveway into the gallbladder. The gallbladder is nothing more than storage of bile. It doesn't make bile, it stores bile. The liver made it. We release bile out of the gallbladder and thus get rid of it out of our body in the presence of fat. That is what's important as far as us leading into this portion with regard to fat and digestion. So it's the cystic duct that's actually going into the gallbladder. If someone has their gallbladder removed, we're cutting the cystic duct taking the gallbladder out, and then the person ends up with just their common hepatic duct and then the common bile duct. So if you have a gallbladder, basically what's going below the cystic duct is a common bile. What's above it is common hepatic duct. So what does bile do? Well, if it's just waste leaving the liver, it's just filled with waste, so it's garbage but we actually do something good with this garbage. It is going to be the mechanical digester of fats. So when we do mechanical digestion, when we break it down to smaller pieces, if you imagine a beaker, if I had a beaker of water and I were just to pour in a bunch of oil, olive oil, canola oil, whatever kind of oil, whatever we want, we just pour it in there. And they're gonna have this oil slick on top of the water. We could get a spoon, stir it up as much as we want, and then move around for a while, and then whoop, separate back again. So it's just like trying to chew butter. You're just gonna chew it together, it's just gonna glom back together again until we put some detergent in it, and that's really what bile is. Bile salt is a type of detergent. So if we were to drop in some you know, soap, what, is, what a detergent is, Drop, put a couple drops of, say, dishwashing soap into this beaker of our water and our oil, and we use our spoon and mix it up, what's going to happen to the oil at that point? Hmm? It stays mixed up. So you'll spin it around, and then the oil, which was one giant oil slick at the top, turns into lots of little beads, right? Just lots of little circles, look like individual little bubbles, and it never re-globs back together again. That is because the detergent went in and helped separate. And that's what, what is known as emulsification. So it does mechanical digestion of fats, but the term for that that is coming up when we do digestion is known as 
emulsification. And that's just breaking fat up into smaller pieces. So you have smaller droplets of fat rather than one giant oil slick. Later, when we get into digestion, recall that the pancreatic lipase will then go in and start to break bonds, but it can get around and get into the fat more easily. As opposed to like a dog that eats, you know, a big giant hunk of meat and just goes, you know, and they just eat a big thing. Well, that's a lot, takes a long time for the pepsin to get around and break that down. So again, if it's a big oil slick, you're gonna take a long time breaking it down with just lipase. You really need the emulsification of it for the lipase to be able to have better access and do better chemical digesting when the time comes. So back to the liver. The role of bile is not only to remove waste from the body, waste are gonna include cholesterol remnants, phospholipids, the breakdown of our red blood cells, the bilirubin, there's gonna be a whole bunch of inorganic ions. The ions means charged molecules, they might glom together and that's how you're gonna get gallstones. So based on each of our unique diets and our unique metabolism and hormonal levels and what's being excreted at any given time from our liver, what our liver is processing, our bile is all going to have slightly varied components. Some people are going to have some bile that might be more likely for these ions to bond together and precipitate, meaning form a salt or an ultimately a stone. The same thing is going to happen just in a different way in the kidney. When you remove waste, a lot of these are charged particles, positive and negative particles that at the right concentration will actually bond together. So in the kidney, it's going to make crystals. That's how you get kidney stones. In the bile, it's a bunch of waste with charged particles. They may come together and you'll have gallstones. So that's a way to get rid of waste. Dumps into our GI tract and we just poop it out. But we also utilize bile to emulsify fats and break it down mechanically since our teeth wasn't doing the job that we would normally want it to do. The detoxification story with regard to liver, just gonna give you a quick overview. Um, there is a hydroxylation conjugation process is really what it's called. It's just a way to take a molecule and you're going to hydroxylate it, sort of like a, a one-two punch in terms of chemical processing to deactivate and break down whatever it is. It could be estrogen, it could be medications. Tylenol, for instance, goes through this cytochrome P450 pathway. It also is a pathway that will process hormones, it'll process some other things. The detoxification story for the liver is there are things in our body that the liver needs to just get rid of and dump into the bile that we want to remove from the body. And there's many pathways. Medications and alcohol can interfere with some of these pathways, making the removal of this breakdown and removal of these potentially offending agents impaired and so that we might have more of these offending agents circulating through our body causing harm. That's the point, the cytochrome P50 is just one pathway. It's one of the more common ones and it had been fairly recently included of note in terms of pharmacology and whether medications are affecting it. And so that's essentially just a way to get rid of um, detoxifying and getting rid of waste. This slide just really says the liver can make stuff. It's making glucose. It can make fatty acids. It can make triglycerides. So the liver can actually form things as sort of the alchemist of our body. For instance, somebody with a high triglycerides, if they do a blood level, they're getting their blood test, they're getting their cholesterol test, and they get their triglycerides, and their triglycerides are really high. They may think, I'm just eating a lot of fat. And then you start eating more low-fat foods, which tends to be higher carbs, and then you actually make it worse. And you go back, and your triglycerides are even higher. The liver, this is an early indicator of diabetes, of it's sort of a pre-diabetes marker. When someone's triglycerides start to go up, it really is the body's compensation mechanism. So triglycerides actually can be raised significantly in the presence of a lot of extra carbohydrates. And that is one of the things that precede insulin resistance early on. The liver also makes plasma proteins. We talked about albumin, clotting factors. So if you have a problem with your liver, you might have a problem with clotting. You may also, we talked about albumin, you may have edema because you don't have enough albumin to help hold water into your blood. So these are just examples of how the liver plays a role in so many things, whether it's blood triglycerides or 
edema, whether you're going to have puffy arms and you know, legs because you don't have enough albumin. And so it really is involved in a lot of things. When people have a compromised liver, they have many other subsequent problems because of the liver's inactivity in so many things. So on to digestion proper. We learned in the mouth that we started to digest carbohydrates. Who can tell me what in the mouth is used to digest carbohydrates? Yeah, and so we'll call this salivary amylase in the mouth. That's gonna digest carbohydrates. And then the food continues on down. And then the stomach, we're gonna digest proteins in how we're gonna digest proteins. Pepsin, so we have pepsin. Pepsin only works at a pH of two to three. And then in the duodenum is where we can digest it all. So we've got in the duodenum, we're digesting carbohydrates with what? Carbohydrates. Pancreatic amylase. And what is it? I heard it for proteins. Yep, we'll do trypsin. And that's going to be at a pH anywhere from six to eight. And then who remembers the fat? Yep, pancreatic lipase. So I'll put here. This here is going to be in the duodenum. So you can see we have a head start on our carbs and our proteins, but in the duodenum, we take care of everything anyways. So the structure of carbohydrates are this, where we have kind of a complex carbohydrate that comes in, we might mechanically digest it, break it down to smaller pieces, but ultimately when we get an amylase to it, we're gonna cleave these bonds. We get down to a disaccharide level and ultimately to a monosaccharide level, which is our glucose. Protein, same thing. There's going to be a whole chain. They might be configured in a multitude of ways, but really we're just trying to get down to one little bead, one amino acid. That's what we're going to absorb. That's what's going to cross the villi and get into our hepatic portal system. Fats, a little bit different. So it's kind of what some picture what some fats look like. So this is the point where we have bile is going to be the emulsifier. It's going to make fat go into smaller pieces which actually happens here in the duodenum. So here we go, um, bile is going, to, is going to emulsify fat. That's gonna be step one for fat. And number two is going to be pancreatic lipase. We'll chemically digest fat, but that's all gonna happen here in the duodenum. So based on this picture, when we break down fat, and we're chemically digesting fat, literally what we're doing are breaking these bonds here. And so that way we end up with a free fatty acid. And you're gonna actually get three of them in this trouble. So you have another free fatty acid here and another free fatty acid there. It is the free fatty acids that's gonna cross the villi and go into what's in the villi that's gonna pick up fat. Our capillaries picked up the monosaccharides and the amino acids, being the carb and the protein, to bring it to the liver, but fats get picked up in a different thing, lacteals. So you guys remember in this, here's a single villi, our columnar cells go in and get the capillary all within the villi, and then this is the lacteals, separate one, kind of as a core here. So fats get absorbed and they go into our lymphatic system. So in fact, you could eat a whole lot of fat and the lymphatic fluid will be milky white. It's kind of gross, it's normally clear. So we, this is the emulsification story. If you have a giant fat blob, big oil slick, you throw in some bile, it's just like showing, throwing in some soap or something, mix it all up, now you'll have little, tiny little fat droplets. Individual fatty, so you have still a triglyceride, or these guys are little phospholipids, then you've got two little fatty acid chains, versus the triglyceride obviously has three fatty acid chains. So the drawings within these bubbles are still showing you the fat has retained its chemical structure, sort of like a cracker. If you hit it with a hammer, the individuals are still chemically a cracker. So it's not, has not been chemically digested. That would happen only if we had pancreatic lipase to it. 
then that's going to, but pancreatic lipase now has better access to start cleaving these bonds and making free fatty acids that we can then absorb. This is the protein story. So this is exactly what we've already seen. So if you recall the gastric pits, we have these long gastric pits here. If we recall at the very top, we're going to have the goblet cells. That does not contribute to digestion. That just contributes to our own protection. The parietal cells, instead of being spread out like I have here, tends to be a higher concentration towards the middle, and the chief cells are at a higher concentration towards the bottom of the gastric pits. When we digest proteins, it's a two-step process. So we want a, a protein arrives into the stomach. We then send, have a signal that sends out pepsinogen from the chief cells. Then we tell our parietal cells to secrete out hydrochloric acid. That converts pepsinogen into pepsin. Additional hydrochloric acid gets released, which will drop our pH to about two to three. So it becomes very acidic. And now pepsin becomes activated. It's now activated and that it can cleave these amino acid polypeptide chains and now separate them into smaller chains and it can do that over and over again. And that's the chemical digestion process. And so you might get you know, a three or four link chain by the time it gets into the duodenum and then trypsin can finish it off. Mucus, as we recall, is just there to protect ourselves. What would we get if we didn't have enough mucus? Not the stomach ulcer, exactly. So no matter how you get it, whether it's H. pylori or stress or whatever, it really comes down to it's a mucus problem. Carbohydrates, we've got it in the mouth, saliva, salivary amylase, then finally the duodenum, finish it up with pancreatic amylase. Now there's brush border enzymes. Really, it's just if you get back down to a disaccharide, you know, done enough digesting, by the time you bump up against a villi, we have tiny little enzymes there that can do a last little snip. So it's really not a big part of the big chopping it down to smaller pieces. It's just like the last drop in the tour into a one kind of thing. And the same for um, amino acids as well. We are absorbing straight into the capillaries, proteins in the stomach. We have to have a low pH for this to happen. The duodenum, trypsin is going to be at a moderate pH. And then we have brush water enzymes that can you know, cleave off the last little tours into single amino acid molecules to bring in, again, to the capillaries. So both the carbs and the proteins go into the capillaries in the blood. They're gonna then run through the liver first before going to the hepatic vein and then to our circulation. Lipids, we have lingual lipase and we have gastric lipase, but because we have yet to emulsify the fat, they really are not very effective. They're only useful if you're just eating something that has a small fat component to it. For the general purposes of our class, the significant part of fat digestion is really all going to take place in the duodenum. We emulsify it, break into small pieces by bile, and then pancreatic lipase is going to go cleave those bonds so that we have now free fatty acids by the time we're done. And then it's the lacteals. So they're known as or chylomicrons, is the individual. There's free fatty acids, but they assemble as chylomicrons. But just think of fat, once it's chemically digested, goes into the lacteals. The last slide for digestion is I want you to know three main hormones. The first hormone, gastrin in the stomach. It is gastrin that sends the signal to the chief cells and the parietal cells. So in this schematic where we showed protein arriving, the part that I did not include is all of a sudden gastrin senses protein, here's an arrived in the stomach, and it says, hey, parietal cells, hey, cheek cells, you better get your job done and we need you to send out your pepsinogen chief cells and parietal cells your hydrochloric acid. So it's the presence of the amino acids or the presence of the proteins in the stomach that gets gastrin to tell these cells what to do. That's gastrin. And it's from the stomach and tells the stomach to start making its secretions. The next two are in the duodenum. In the duodenum, secretin is released when acidic chyme arrives. So in the duodenum here, we'll draw a duodenum. We have our pyloric sphincter and we have our stomach. This part of our stomach, a really looking banana stomach. And then we know we have our liver 
up here. So we'll talk about our gallbladder. I'm gonna send it down here, file down here. So secretin Secretin's released by the duodenum when there is chyme that enters the duodenum. So because chyme enters the duodenum with a really low pH of two to three, secretin does two things. It says, hey, pyloric sphincter, let's slow gastric motility. So it's gonna close So that's the slow gastric motility. It's gonna do that, and at the same time, it's gonna tell the Brunner's glands to do what? What's the Brunner's glands gonna do in response to this low pH? Bicarbonate to neutralize pH. So what happens here, acidic chyme arrives into the duodenum, that's a signal secretin says, slow down stomach, I have to process this. And hey, Brunner's glands send out bicarbonate so we can fix this really low pH and bring our pH closer to six to seven. Right back to our stomach again and our duodenum. The next one is cholecystokinin. That also comes from the duodenum. I'm just gonna abbreviate it, CCK. It arrives, it is released when fat is in the area. So when fatty chyme arrives, the presence of fat says, stomach, slow down. That's again, slowing gastric motility. And it also says gallbladder, release bile. So that bile can now arrive to emulsify the fat. It pretty much, but it's now it has stuff to do, that's why it's telling the stomach slow down. So, we're going to go through three parts of metabolism we have the carbohydrate, lipids, and protein. The bulk of the conversation is going to be about the carbohydrate metabolism, and then we'll just go in on what modifications there are just for proteins and fats. But really, everything you need to know is going to be in the carbohydrate scenario is from start to finish. So if we look at our energy substrates, this is what we've just discussed earlier. We start with polysaccharides, that's the carbohydrates, the big chains, moves down, we break, digest it down into smaller pieces, the tours or the disaccharides, and we ultimately want to be a monosaccharide as we absorb it across the, um, across the villi into our capillaries. So here's a picture, you can see the polysaccharide, that's what it looks like. Chemical digestion is breaking the individual bonds between these. Once we get a single molecule of glucose, that's what we're gonna go talk about when we, I'm gonna start drawing on the board with regards to a single molecule of glucose that we're going to then get energy from. So I really want you to have that perspective when you see how many may come from a single starch food component. Glucose terms are glycogenesis. Well, glycogenesis, let me see, we have a glucose that we absorb and we're gonna turn it into glycogen. Then glycogenolysis, the lysis means breakdown. That's where we take our glycogen and we're breaking it right back down to glucose. Glycogenesis is forming it, and then the lysis is breaking it down. Glucose is what we eat. We eat it. It goes to our cells with the help of insulin. We have extra glucose. Our liver says, hmm, maybe we should save some for later. Okay, so we'll make it into glycogen, and that's the storage form in the liver. And then we're sitting here in class for a couple hours, we're getting a little hungry. So then glycogenolysis takes place and then we can keep our blood glucose levels up. Then this other is gluconeogenesis. So normally we get glucose because we eat carbs. 
but sometimes we need to make glucose mainly because the brain will not live off of anything else. It only will live off of glucose. And if you're not going to eat carbs, then you have to eat it from something else. So fats or proteins can be used to make glucose and really that's for the brain. So that's known as gluco and we can see this part here, meo, meaning from a new a non-carb source. We're going to talk about glycolysis out in the cytosol and then we're going to talk about what then happens within the mitochondria and how we get energy and ATP from that. My slides here, like these lists, I think are not, are kind of, they're just more of a placement of facts. Want you to think, think more about what's actually happening inside the cell. So if we draw a big cell here and we have a capillary next to it. So in the capillary, obviously we're going to have red blood cells, a lot of oxygen loaded onto it. We're going to have glucose in our blood. It's going to be our green dots. We're going to have free fatty acids in our blood too, as well. So we got stuff in our blood. How, so the point here is how are we going to get ATP energy? Whether we're a exercising muscle like a running legs or just sitting there, we have to generate energy just to have our diaphragm move up and down. You know, just basic sitting here um, requires a base level of energy. So we'll start with the glucose story. So we know glucose is going to enter the cells. We know it requires insulin to get into the cells as a receptor. We won't go into the details of that. I just want to make sure you're clear on that. People that have insulin resistant diabetes, that's where they're having a hard time getting glucose into their cells because the insulin receptors not really listening to insulin and not letting that happen. So this is just glucose comes in through the normal way. Insulin's there, everything's good. So now we have glucose in the cell and it really just goes through the process of glycolysis. So that's taking place out in the cytoplasm. Unlike your prerequisite class, many of you may have gone into these in more detail. And I don't really want the details. I really want you to be comfortable of where in the cell these things are taking place and what are the products of each of the steps along the way. So that's really where we're, so we're going to put it together, hopefully here. In glycolysis, we get out of it, we net gain two ATP. That can go right away, just down to our muscles. We can detach myosin heads with it. We can do lots of things. So it's readily acceptable ATP molecules. We get two of these things known as NADH. I like to think of NADH as a token, like a little IOU. Okay, I'm gonna give you three ATP later for it, but right now it's not doing you a lot of good. It's just a piece of paper. Okay, so that's all NADH is. And then we get two pyruvic acid. So that's pretty valuable, pyruvic acid. It's also sort of a form of IOU because you're not getting any ATP right now for this either. So glycolysis is pretty pathetic in that you're just getting two ATP from one glucose. I'm going to do a mitochondria here. So as far as the mitochondria goes, I'm going to always sort of get draw it with this inner membrane. The mitochondria has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. So the outer membrane, we do the Krebs cycle. Here we are doing glycolysis. We get pyruvate. Don't worry about that side. And then we're going to come on over because we're turning pyruvic acid into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is required to enter the Krebs cycle. When we talk about fats, after we go through this whole thing, fat is going to become acetyl-CoA if we need to break it down for energy. If we need to use protein for energy, it will become acetyl-CoA. So right now we're just dealing with glucose. It goes through glycolysis. We get a couple things. Pyruvic acid becomes acetyl-CoA, and then we do the whole Krebs cycle and electron transport chain, and we're going to go through the the basic elements of it. But just know everything that I'm doing now 
is going to be the same thing for fats and proteins because we all start from either any one of those three into becoming acetyl-CoA. So pyruvic acid is our way to get to acetyl-CoA. We get into the Krebs cycle. So in your notes, there's a list of what we get out of the Krebs cycle. So we're going to get two FADHs and we get eight NADH. So we get those are the Krebs cycle. We get a little ATP that we can utilize right away. That's handy. And what waste element also comes from the Krebs cycle? Carbon dioxide. So this is the source of carbon dioxide. I'm gonna draw a little circle around it and that's gonna come out here, CO2. So that CO2 that we've talked about in the respiratory system, we know later it actually binds with water, becomes carbonic acid, helps unload more oxygen, but also as carbonic acid, that's what's how it's gonna make it back to the lungs so we could breathe it out. But it's coming from the Krebs cycle within the mitochondria. The point that I'm trying to make here is where we make CO2, totally different place than we use O2. Because they both have O2 in it, people think it's the same place, but it's not. Both in the mitochondria, but it's this next inner membrane that we're actually gonna need our oxygen. We only get two ATP. So we're really not doing that great. We've only got four ATP so far. Not a lot, several IOUs essentially. Finally, we get into the electron transport chain. And it is the electron transport chain that we take our FADHs, NADH, this NADH, and they all will run through the electron transport chain. And it is the electron transport chain that utilizes oxygen, so I'm gonna write O2, that came from our red blood cell. And that's where we're going to get our ATP, lots of it. I'm just gonna write lots of ATPs that will ultimately go out into the cell. So we redeem our coupons and our, our tokens through the electron transport chain. How much we get for every single NADH, we get three ATP. For every single FADH2, we only get two ATP. That's still pretty good. But. So ultimately, the most amount of ATP that we get through this process comes from the electron transport chain with our oxygen that we're able to redeem these tokens and get some amount of ATP. So a molecule of glucose just anaerobically, meaning not using oxygen, not going through the mitochondria, you're gonna get two ATP. One could argue four maybe because you went through the Krebs cycle, you didn't need oxygen yet either. But if you really wanna go through the whole shebang, you're gonna get, if you mathematically add it up, you can get up to 38 ATP. They tell you, teach it to you, it's 36, because it costs a little energy to get it in. Reality, it could actually be lower than that. But numerically, hey, you went from two to 38. That's a lot, and that's why we can survive and on glucose and why we need oxygen, because it's through oxygen that gives us the main amount of the bulk amount of ATP that we really live off of. So we have pyruvate, pyruvic acid converts in there, becomes acetyl-CoA. So we have, just know the steps. You're getting pyruvic acid, it becomes acetyl-CoA, basically. You shuttle it in, Krebs cycle, waste of CO2, you get a few more of the tokens and you get a little bit of ATP to keep you going. And then the real bulk of your ATP that your cells live off of, that you live off of, is when you convert all your tokens of NADH, FADHs with oxygen into most of the ATP. In the electron transport chain, this is really what it looks like. This is just showing you our NADH and our FADH here. They come through, that's where we're getting our three ATP out of NADH, our two ATP out of FADH2. And it's really this last step that we're actually using our oxygen molecule here. And that's where our ATP comes from. So the electron transport chain is where we convert NADH, FADH2, and we'll redeem our ATP. And that's where the bulk of it's going to come from.
I just want you to know each step what you're getting out of it. So glycolysis, you're getting two ATP, but the important part is really getting pyruvic acid. What happens to pyruvic acid? It becomes acetyl-CoA, and then now we can go through the Krebs cycle. Yeah, we get some more NADH, FADH2s, but that doesn't do us any good, a little bit of ATP, but Krebs cycle, the main thing to know from there is you need acetyl-CoA to get in and you're gonna make carbon dioxide. Then finally, the electron transport chain is where you finally take your NADH, FADH2, and you get your ATP with the help of oxygen. Like came from the Krebs cycle, came from glycolysis, all the preceding steps was just building up these NADHs, FADH2s, but we're not getting ATP until we add oxygen and the electron transport chain. The other important thing that I do want you to know is the times three or times two, that being I want you to know that NADH, you're gonna get three ATP. FADH2, you're gonna get two ATP out of it. So that you really have an idea what each step is on here, not the details of the step, but overall glycolysis, overall Krebs cycle, overall electron transport chain. Where are we going to make pyruvic acid? At what point is acetyl-CoA entering the scene? That's gonna be starting the Krebs cycle. What are we, what, what point do we get carbon dioxide? That would be from the Krebs cycle. At what point do we use oxygen? That's electron transport chain. What part is gonna be inside our mitochondria and what part's gonna be in the cytosol? So if you have an idea of just those basic elements, sort of putting those together as the puzzle, I think that's gonna be the best, that is my best hope for your, you and your understanding from here as far as a big picture goes. So now we'll add fat to the equation here. So fat in general, we have um, a triglyceride is gonna be a glycerol backbone. So triglycerides tend to look like this. You have this backbone here with these zigzags that go down. Anybody here in chemistry? The zigzags are they're always drawn like this, but the zigzags are shorthand for carbon bonds. So every time there's a corner, there is a carbon bond. So this really means it comes down here, a bond to a carbon molecule, and then we go to another carbon molecule, and then we go to another carbon. And technically, you can just draw it as a straight deal. Corner means a carbon, so they just do it as a corner rather than drawing a million little Cs. So essentially what we have here is carbon to carbon to carbon to carbon to carbon. And a carbon, because it likes to have four, it shares four electrons, the sides will always be hydrogens. So you have these little H's off to the side. I have some pictures coming up to show you, but anyways. So when you see these zigzag chains, it's organic chemistry shorthand essentially for this. A saturated fat is going to be all of these like this. If you have an unsaturated fat, you're going to have a double bond because now you drop, so it's unsaturated. So when we see here fatty acids and glycerol, it just means our three fatty acids, those are the each individual zigzag, and the glycerol is sort of the backbone that they're all attached to. So if we're digesting it and our pancreatic lipase comes out to digest our triglycerides that we ate, it's actually breaking this bond. So we free these free fatty acids, so now they're loose into three individual loose fatty acids and then the glycerol by itself really gets processed, I'll just say glucose. But steroids, like the cholesterol, um, that's also a fat-based thing. And then phospholipids, those are also additional things that are used for cell membranes. They end up having two fatty acid chains. So I just wanted you to have an example of what are fat, what constitutes fat, those kind of things that are gonna be in our diet. The processing terminology, so lipogenesis, Lipogenesis is where we take food and we're gonna make a triglyceride. And then lipolysis is where we take our triglyceride and we actually turn it into free fatty acids, which ultimately through then beta oxidation, we turn into two carbon units 
that will then become acetyl-CoA. So I oversimplified it. So if we have it's a triglyceride, right? Then we're going to have the whole bile and the lipase, pancreatic lipase. And then we absorb it into our lacteals. Then we have as free fatty acids. We absorb it and then we reassemble it because this is going to be the fat that's in your butt. So we start off as triglycerides and then we break it down, we absorb it, and then now we're like the fat wherever the fat is, or whether it's in your belly or whatever. That's the triglyceride. So this is the inside our body triglycerides. So we have, that's lipogenesis, is as we're eating more food and we just ate a lot extra of food and we're eating, and that's our body going lipogenesis is now adding to our fat storage form. So that's lipogenesis and then lipolysis is breaking down our storage form. So if we decide to go for a run or a walk or something, we're like, hey, we need a little more energy. Let's break down our triglycerides that we have stored throughout the body, free them up, free those free fatty acids. And so that's what we have here. This is our free fatty acids that came from lipolysis it's in the blood. Does that make sense from where this came from? Sort of. For Lipid processing, we have lipogenesis. That's the formation of triglycerides for storage in our body. Lipolysis is the breakdown of our storage in our body, mobilizing it so that we can burn it off. So if we want to exercise and we're trying to burn off our triglycerides in our fat storage, we want lipolysis to take place. Beta oxidation is if we take our free fatty acids, so that's my zigzags here in the blood. So if we, if we remember the each corner represents a carbon. So we have these little carbons here. The beta oxidation is taking these chains, carbon chains, and I'm just gonna write here, beta oxidation is gonna turn them into carbon to carbon units. And it's these two units. So ultimately beta oxidation is cleaving those bonds right there. Right, so you're going to end up with multiple two carbon units, and then that is going to become acetyl CoA. Same story with making carbon dioxide, giving us some NADHs, eight of them, giving us a couple of FADH2s, got a little ATP, and so on. So everything is the same. So that's just how we got to that point. What this slide tells you is just of our triglycerides, this part is going to be like glycerol we're gonna just process it just like glucose, okay? So that's that first part. And then each of the chains are gonna go through beta oxidation to become acetyl-CoA, okay? Trans fats are bad, but I wanted to tell you what trans are. So the upper, you can see where the double bond is, how it bends in, that's a cis, so it's back to chemistry. Cis and trans, they're just ways that a molecule bends. So the double bonds, if it mends in like this with the hydrogen on the same side, that means it's a cis configuration, which your body likes. If it goes opposite, it's trans, and your body hates it. So trans fats, we can see the difference here. This would be a cis configuration with a single double bond. This is a trans with a double bond and versus saturated. We know saturated fatty acids are solid at room temperature, right? Those are the bad fats, like it is lard, butter, um, versus the unsaturated fatty acids like fish oil or canola oil or olive oil, those ones. So we can see when we take one and we put it in the trans way, almost like a saturated fat, so it helps it be solid, but it actually stabilizes it, why trans fats are used in like chips and you know, fried French fries and things like that because it actually stabilizes it. And if you're gonna do for storage, that's why Twinkies can last like infinity pretty much. You know, so you've got elements, preservatives in there and the trans fat. So this is what they look like. This is what trans fat does. But the main important one is this one, all cause mortality by 25%. So if you consume trans fats on a regular basis in your diet, your rate of death from anything is up by 25% just out of the gate. Coronary heart disease, MI means heart attack, myocardial infarction, and so on. But the most important thing, especially for pregnant women, is this. 
Pregnant mothers consuming trans fatty acids leads to a hypothalamic inflammation. Remember hypothalamus in the brain of the baby. And so it's gonna impair satiety in offspring. That means those babies now lose their receptor balance that says when you're full. And so they don't get full no matter what they're eating. So you can see how it's gonna induce obesity that doesn't go away this is after the baby's born, after their diet's changed. If you're like pregnant and you're like, woohoo, I'm pregnant, I can eat whatever I want. And you're like, eat french fries and whatever, you're, the trans fats that's coming in your mouth is actually having an impact on the brain of the neonate that you've got going on in there. So this is what you shouldn't eat. Onion rings, all of that. So that's all bad food, trans fats. So back to metabolism, Krebs cycle with fat. We did the beta oxidation, two carbon units. We went, became acetyl-CoA. It went into the Krebs cycle. The tokens being FADH2 and NADH now go through the electron transport chain utilizing oxygen. That's where we get the bulk of our ATP. But the point with this slide is to let you know from a triglyceride, look at how much ATP you get versus one thing from fat. So the glucose, the most we would get was 38 numerically, technically it's about 36. So a triglyceride, we're getting, depends on how long the chains are, so that's why it could be and sort of in general. You know, we're looking at north of 100, but which is why fat is so good for survival. And that was really the benefit of fat, is it was a very economical way for us to store food in anticipation of starvation scenarios or winters or whatnot. So speaking of starvation, our brain cannot handle burning fats and proteins. We need glucose only for the brain. So if you are not going to bring in glucose in your diet and you're only eating fat and protein and no glucose is in your diet, your brain is not too happy about it. So normally, we have beta oxidation, takes our fatty acid chains, turns them into acetyl-CoA. However, if we have to do gluconeogenesis, where now we have to make glucose from a fat source instead, because we're eating fat but not glucose, we actually use this oxaloacetic acid to form the glucose for the brain. So what happens with the Krebs cycle is we actually get a buildup of acetyl-CoA, but we're not able to complete our Krebs cycle. So it's this acetyl-CoA buildup that ultimately leaves our body as ketones. And so that's how you develop ketones, and that's ketogenesis. Ketogenesis, it is when you try to make glucose from a non-carb source, gluconeogenesis, and ketones are a byproduct of that. Ketones, if you can smell them, it's really bad. Is that just because your body isn't using the glucose mm -hmm. at all? It's there, but it's not being accessed. Exactly. So, in type 1 diabetes, people can be at risk for ketogenic shock. They can go into a ketogenic coma. They could get, um, they form ketones. So, if they're type 1 diabetic, what does that mean? So, let's just kind of figure that out first. Type they're not making enough insulin. Yeah. So their beta cells are, you know, being killed by your immune system. They're not making enough insulin. So they have glucose. They got loads of glucose around, but because they're on insulin, it's not going in. So it's almost like the cells are like, we've got no glucose. There's no glucose. So it's the same effect as no glucose in the type one diabetics. And so you're not getting it. The brain meanwhile is freaking out because it doesn't have insulin to send it in. And so the brain freaks out and says, I still need it. And so the fat in the body gets converted. There's a huge buildup of ketones. And these people can also often be you know, passed out and they're kind of laying there and someone goes up to them and think, what's wrong? And then they smell their breath and it's fruity and they think, oh, you've just been drinking, you're passed out. And that's one mistake that can be made. And these people are actually in a diabetic coma because they are producing that you're smelling the ketones and often misinterpreted based on that fruity smell, but it's really the same effect. Even though you have lots of glucose around, if you don't have insulin, your body doesn't know that. It just reacts like it doesn't have any. So ketogenesis, not consuming glucose, you need to use other resources in the body. I don't care that you know oxalacetic acid. If you're not using other resources in the body, you have to then make glucose for the brain. You get a buildup of acetyl-CoA, the byproduct is ketones. 
Okay, so with regard to proteins, we know they're polypeptides, they get broken down to the tours, dipeptides, but we absorb it as amino acids. When we want to utilize proteins for energy, which is usually in a starvation situation because it's not something that we normally would want to do, we have to deaminate it. So I want you to know what deamination means. Deamination means it's removing an amine group. So an amine group is just NH2, again, chemistry mumbo jumbo. NH2 can actually form NH4+, plus, which is ammonia. The point there is not so much me telling you about the chemistry, is that if we have to use proteins for energy, we have to pop off the acetamine group, we're making ammonia as a byproduct. That's not really good for us. So this again is a situation of, hey, we're starving. We need to use some like burning up our own proteins for fuel. We're gonna make a few nasty byproducts, but we're gonna still stay alive until hopefully some food comes along. So really in order to utilize um, proteins, if I go here, protein, we're going to deaminate it and ultimately we get to pyruvate, but then we get down to acetyl-CoA. So again, everything gets to acetyl-CoA, whether it's glycolysis through pyruvic acid, protein deaminating, it also becomes pyruvic acid, or fat, beta oxidation, two carbon units. Again, all three of those become acetyl-CoA at some point. The last thing I'll point out are there are essential amino acids. There are, there used to be just essential and non-essential. Does anybody know what that means? You need it, you don't need it. <laughs> non-essential, you need it, but you can make it in your body. Essential, the list there, there's nine of them, means you can't make it. You've got to have it in your diet somehow. So you've got to eat it. The non-essentials, it's nice if you eat it, but if you don't, the essentials can mess, configure and form the non-essentials. And then there's these conditionals, that's a new category. The conditional are now some that are required. So it's almost like saying, oh, instead of non-essential, we can just make them. Conditional are like, you kind of do need to have these in your diet. But then I thought, well, let me tell you where they're coming from. So these are complete proteins. Animal proteins obviously are the easiest way um, to get all your proteins, your essential ones. But if you want to be a vegetarian, it's good, it's way healthier. For sure to be a vegetarian, you should eat more plant-based foods, which is way healthier, but you better eat the right plants. The story that I'm wanting to add to you guys here is, I'm gonna redraw this as a summary, and I wanna add in the lactic acid component. Okay, here's our cell. Glucose into glycolysis. Glycolysis takes place in the cytosol. We get two ATP right away for use. We get two NADHs, which we will use later here in the mitochondria. So this NADH, we're going to ultimately bring that in here. So I'm going to say NADH. I'm going to save that story for later. That's going in there. And we get two pyruvic acids. Okay. So they will come over here and become acetyl-CoA, and go into the Krebs cycle. So I'll sort of draw it at the circle to indicate the cycle. It's one of my shorthand for that. Who can tell me what the Krebs cycle produces? Yep, so we're gonna get CO2 that's gonna leave the cell. What else does it produce? So then we're gonna get some more NADHs. We actually get, or we get eight of those guys from the Krebs cycle. We had two of them from out here. Um, so that came from there. And you said FADH2, I, I misinterpreted. And then we have FADH2 
get two of those. Okay. And now next, then the next thing that happens is through the electron transport chain, we take all of these guys, we bring them through the chain, we use oxygen, and now we're gonna make loads of ATP. You should know that ATP, that the NADH H is going to equal, for every one, we're gonna get three ATP, so technically, we have 10 of them, so it's our 30 ATP right there if we really wanted to get technical. FADH2, we're going to get two ATP. We get two of them right here, so that's four. So that's our 34. No, we have two here, here, if you want to go through. But I want you to know where carbon dioxide is made. I want you to know where oxygen is utilized. I want you to know what you get out of NADH, FADH2. I want you to know that the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain take place in the mitochondria of the cell, that glycolysis takes place out in the cytosol. So if this is our body just running normally. And say we're out for a nice little run, we're running together, we're talking, so you have the conversation, you're talking to each other easily, um, and then we decide we're gonna race. Okay, so now, we're gonna go faster, so we need to make more ATP. So now we're huffing and puffing, and our oxygen that's being supplied on our red blood cells obviously is coming here. But when we get to a point that's known as the lactic acid threshold, if you're in exercise physiology, if you're running with somebody or you've got somebody on a treadmill, and that you keep increasing the ramp of the treadmill to the point when you're taking a blood sample, but all of a sudden you find, what is this color here? Lactic acid in the blood. At what point did the cell just go, wow, I'm just gonna kick out some lactic acid? The point that it does is when, think of this as a factory. And you got a little assembly line, you have just a set number of workers. So we have pyruvic acid, acetyl-CoA going in. We have oxygen really going. So as you're limited if we zip through as much oxygen as we can supply. So if we're huffing and puffing and we can't deliver any more oxygen, or maybe we can deliver more oxygen, but we don't have any more mitochondria to make more, to do more with it. Basically, we've maxed out our assembly line ability of our mitochondria. It's already working at 100% but you want to race your friend and you want more or your treadmill went up. So your, your body needs to do more and it can for a short period of time. That's when this pyruvic acid, we start running more glycolysis. So we start making more pyruvic acid, but because the mitochondria is already at a hundred percent capacity with what we were making before, but we had to just do the extra bit it's gonna temporarily leave the cell as lactic acid because we're getting a backlog of the pyruvic acid trying to run through the mitochondria. So we're supplying it with more you know, product than it can handle processing with the oxygen going through here. So if someone's gonna train and you wanna raise your lactic acid threshold, meaning go further before you can hit your lactic acid, training not only brings more blood vessels to your legs and to your working muscles so you have better oxygen delivery but we make more mitochondria in those muscle cells too so that's what aerobic training does for you so you can last longer without reaching your lactic acid threshold so the threshold just means what's the point of exertion that we are getting our extra energy here just so we can sprint or run with our friend and try to beat them um, and getting our two ATP, but meanwhile, we're making extra pyruvic acid, but we don't want acid hanging out in the cell. We don't want our cells pH to drop, so we drop it out here to make lactic acid. But handy, remember lactic acid is gonna help deliver more oxygen at the same time. So we can actually, that's in the respiratory system. 